Welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, where stories about the power of focus and resilience are revealed by the people who live those stories. And now, the host of the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, Jack Hopkins. All right, hello and welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast. I'm your host, Jack Hopkins. Today's guest is somebody you've probably seen on social media thousands of times. She goes by JoJo from Jers, and Joanne Carducci has become a social media celebrity in a really quick period of time. She started her Twitter account in 2017, and as of this recording, has about 951,000 followers. Can we just go ahead and call that a million? Yeah, I think we can. She's also got a huge following on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and my favorite, her Are You Effing Kidding Me newsletter on Substack. Look, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time more than I already have going into trying to introduce Joe Carducci for one reason she starts off in just about the perfect place kind of laying out the groundwork for where she came from what she did prior to becoming a superstar sensation if you will on social media how she got into it why she's doing it and everything in between so let's dive right into my conversation with the beautiful, with the funny, the dynamic, and the smart, Joe Carducci. All right, Joe, welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast. I've really been looking forward to this, to, to meet the person behind the articles that I read uh, with your Substack uh, newsletter, the posts. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you get so attached to this person online through print and then at some point you get curious and you go, I, I want to know this person, you know, in the flesh with through their voice, everything, the facial expression. So here we are. Hi, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Screen to screen. I am, I exist. I'm real. <laughs> I'm a lot of real. Unfortunately. You are indeed. You, you are indeed. I, I want to bring something up right off the bat that may or may not make you blush a little, but I think our listeners, viewers should know because I think it's such a useful frame around everything else that will happen. You graduated from Emerson College and I did a little homework on this. Emerson College admissions has an acceptance rate of 43%. Half of the applicants admitted to Emerson College also submitted test scores who, who submitted test scores, have an SAT score between 1250 and 1430 or an ACT of between 30 and 32. You also have to have a GPA of 3.73 to get into Emerson. Now, my undergrad degree is from Graceland University where Bruce Jenner, before he was Caitlyn Jenner, that's where he was going to school. Uh, I think maybe even training there for the decathlon, oh, wow. you know, when he won the uh, decathlon in 76, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you something. It's a good thing that Graceland University did not have those requirements because I, I, I'll, I will reveal this for the first time on this podcast. I graduated high school with a 1.46 GPA. I went to high school to play. That's what I did. I played during the day and I played after school when I played sports. I did just well enough to be able to stay on the football and the track team. And it wasn't until several years after I graduated that I said, okay, now let me buckle down and see if I could have done any better. So I say I went to high school and college at the same time mm -hmm. because I totally, I had total disregard for high school when I went. But you, on the other hand, uh, you were cracking the books. Well, buckle up because 
I'm going to tell you something that I probably never said on a podcast or even tweeted about. And I'm going to tell you the truth now. I did get into Emerson. That is true. Um, I did not get into Emerson on the basis of my great grades because my grades coming out of high school were a freaking train wreck because I <laughs> thought I was too cool for school. I love school. I thought it was amazing, but I was like, I don't, just don't feel like going today. And so here's breaking news. I've probably never said anywhere either. I was also very badly behaved and I was lacking in simple things like discipline. I'll blame the fact that I was the youngest of five on that, but it's really just my nature. Um, I, I'm, I'm not very well disciplined. I, I'm much better at it now than I ever was. All of my siblings served in the military. I at least knew I couldn't do that. <laughs> the utmost respect for the military, but if I know myself, which I do, I'd be like, I'm sorry, <laughs> Captain. I'm so not in the mood to do those push-ups right now. So I did not, um, but they were all, they all served. Anyway, I digress because I decided not to go to school so much that they sent me to summer school my senior year, which means I didn't get to walk with my class. I had to end up getting my diploma after high school because I was an asshole. If I can say that on your show, I don't know, but I was not disciplined. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I was a total asshole and I was not disciplined and I was this incredible disappointment to my father because he used to say, you're so smart. What, what's wrong with you? You could get great grades and you could... I just thought I was above it, right? So I needed a good smacking down. And that was that was a gut check like I'd never had watching my friends graduate on time when I wasn't. So fast forward to, uh, I go to community college. I did get great grades in community college. I will say that. Um, I got straight A's mostly in community college. And then I was like, okay, what do I do now? I want to go to a four-year school. I want to find my perfect four-year school. I was in a relationship with someone who decided to move to New York to be an actor. And I was like, I don't know where I fit in. I don't know where to go. I don't know what I want to do. So he went to New York to be an actor and I went to Michigan. No offense, Michigan. Love you very much. I went to Saginaw, which I now know is you do this. Um, and I moved in with my sister and her husband and their three-year-old son. And I did that because he was the sun and moon and stars of my entire life. I had no other. He was my first nephew. And I was like, I don't know where else to go. I want to be around this child that makes me happy. My sister and her husband thought it was fine. And I moved to Michigan in the winter, um, which is yeah. snowy and cold in a way that nowhere I've ever been was snowy and cold. And I got very depressed very quickly. I couldn't find like my people. I didn't have any friends there. I got a job at a restaurant where everyone was very nice, but they were just not my people. I didn't connect with them. And I was becoming so withdrawn and I started embarking on an eating disorder, which is a whole different conversation. And I was sitting in this coffee shop every day, the coolest spot in this whole town. I would just sit there and drink coffee. And this is before cell phones and stuff. So I would just write, you know, I would just write. And I had found this one school that I thought um, resonated with me because I thought I wanted to be the next um, <laughs> the next presidential spokesperson, the press secretary. I thought I was that was my future. So this school, Emerson, had this tiny little major, which was communication, politics, and law. It was in Boston. I didn't have anywhere near the grades to get in. I didn't have the SAT scores to get in. And I wrote an essay that captured where I was in my life and why I had this epiphany that I needed to go to that school, that that school was going to change my life. And I wrote my heart out. I wrote my heart out. And I sat in that coffee shop for days writing it. I sent it. I got a call a couple of weeks later from the dean who said, I got to tell you, your grades are terrible. <laughs> but this is the best essay I think I've ever read. And we want you to, if you'll, if you'll do this, we want you to entertain like a probationary basis enrollment in our, in our college. And I was like, what? Me? Really? And that's it. It was my essay. Um, and then I went and interviewed with them. I forgot I had to do, I didn't have to go in person and interview with them with my essay and my in-person interview. And I got in and, uh, and then I fucked that one up too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a similar track record at that age, by the way. <laughs> I have a feeling a lot of people do. Yeah. And you know what? That's okay. This is the way I look at life, honestly. I, I know this is going to sound like one of those things people just say, but I've, had a, I've done a lot of work in the last couple of years, and I know that mistakes are the things you're supposed to be like, oh, God, I wish I had never, and I, I, oh, I regret that. And I, I, 
I, I don't know if regret is the word. I feel like if I hadn't made all those mistakes and fucked up in the ways that I had, that I would not be the person that I am today. So I don't look at them Absolutely. with that framing of like regret in the way that they shouldn't have never happened. They happened. And I have to accept that. And then I have to see what I did about it. So that's kind of where I am with that. I agree. I, you, you said that beautifully. I've, I, I've always felt like this. Or not always. I do now. I, I like who I am today. I like where I've been for a while. And I have a real clear understanding that who I am today was built upon all the experiences, not just the good ones, but the really fucked up experiences as well. And so for that, I'm grateful for them as much as I cursed them and as much as I thought life was over for me when they were happening. Yeah. Now I almost see them as having been almost a necessary part of this moment. I could not agree with you more. And I think that to get to a place like that, you have to do a lot of introspective thought. You really do. You kind of have to, you have to be honest with yourself too. That's, that's crucial because it's one thing to like, to like gloss over them and pack them away and be like, everything's fine. That's fine. I did that thing. It's fine. It's another thing to be like, Oh fuck, I did that thing. And that thing happened to me or and like, <laughs> right. what does that mean about me? And what am I really taking away from this? Um, though that's, and that's, that's okay. You know what I mean? It's okay to, to be honest with yourself like that. It's good. I tell my kids, like my son in particular, he's 14. And I say, I think that the most instructive moments of my life have been the, the biggest mistakes I've made. They've taught me the most. They've given me the most um, perspective and insight and um, guidance, much more than any of the successes ever did. Well, and I think that that's something that really comes out of your writing is there's no question that you are being you. And I think that's so important today because there are so many examples out there of people who are putting things out, not to say that what they're putting out isn't good, but it's, it doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel like the person who is writing it is really channeling themselves. And I, I would say this is true for both of us. My writing following me it's not for everyone you know what i mean it's uh, but the people that it's for tell me over and over again that it's kind of that brutal honesty that that's what they're craving and i know you've been told that countless times and i think people crave that right now because we've been fed so much bullshit for so many years from so many people that when somebody is finally telling you the truth and bearing their soul and saying, look, here's who I am. Here's the good stuff and the really shitty stuff. You look at it all. And if you still want to hang around and read my stuff, I'd, I'd love to have you. Yeah. yeah. And I, that's what I appreciate you, about you too. And I think that it is, again, something that comes with living life and gaining perspective and looking at yourself and looking at your thoughts and your choices. Um, I think you have, you really have to live your life as authentically as possible and, and convey that authenticity whenever you're talking or, or interacting with others, because that is so lacking in the universe today. Everyone is trying to be someone or something they're not. They're trying to express thoughts and ideas that they don't actually have. And then when not, those things invariably never land where they're supposed to because they can't, because it's not coming from a place that's genuine. And you know it, we're all human beings. We know when something is coming at us from somewhere that is genuine. Well, largely we do because now with so much misinformation on social media, it's harder, but you can generally still get a sense of it. And I'll tell you this other thing too, for me personally, I went through a really large chunk of my life where I was sort of denying my own reality and spiraling downward into like this depressed cycle of just being a function of like motherhood in suburbia. And I lost my sense of who I was and what, what was, what was burning inside of me was becoming really Ex extinguished and I wasn't being true to myself and what I was putting forth was this face that was happy and smiley and everything's fine when I was actually dying inside and and just didn't want to participate anymore so I kind of stifled myself for so long that 
when I went through and I went through a separation and then divorce and then my whole life was turned upside down and it's really very different now than it ever was, I made a commitment to myself that anything I ever put forward in this world, whether that's an essay or a tweet or a video or a podcast or a conversation with another human being, had to be 1000% representative of who I am. And that's good and bad. It's a lot of bad. Like, like you said, I know the lumps that come with this whole thing. I get it. And I'm working on all of sure. it, but um, I own it. And, I, and I'm always going to lead with that. I try and instill that in my children as much as possible, too. And I think what's interesting about this commitment that you said you made to yourself, when you look at the reach that you have today, and it's ever growing, you know, it's interesting because you might argue that you have as much of a reach and maybe a, a more more vigorous support from the people who you are able to reach than had you have been the White House press secretary. Mm -hmm. have, I mean, have you ever thought about that and compared the two and say, you know, where could I actually have done the most good? And I would argue it, it very likely is what you're doing right now. I have never considered that. Uh, it's a funny thing that you say that because that's kind of like a, like that gif of the guy's head exploding. It kind of feels like that a little bit because it does line up with so much of how I believe life sort of works out, which sounds like a very privileged thing for someone to say. But um, I found that the twists and turns and curves and ups and downs, I feel like I've always been on a path that I didn't even know I was on. And it did, I don't know that that means it's exclusively fate and I'm not counting myself out of the equation, but I always thought that, that for me, the bookends were that I wanted to be the press secretary. And then one day I got to go to the White House and stand behind that podium. And I thought, well, that's it, right? That's as, as stark, uh, you know, a, a bookend as you could ever get the, the dream and the, and the very strange paths to getting there in a very different way. But I didn't think about in that moment what you just made me realize, I guess, and that I should consider and give more thought to is that like, it really wasn't just about me standing there. The bookend of that moment was kind of like, well, you found a way to have an impact in a different way. And I, I know I don't want to compare them in terms of reach or value, but but I've managed to use my voice to find my path to being able to talk to people and share with people and hopefully change the world for the better, which was the aspiration I had back then. It just doesn't look exactly like I thought it would, but that is interesting. I hadn't really made that, had, hadn't really made that comparison in my brain, but it is, it is an interesting one to make. No offense to Jen Psaki or KG Payton, KGP or anything, because <laughs> you're great, but I, I'll beat you. Okay. No, not, maybe not Jen. Though. Well, yeah. I kind of had that epiphany this morning about you as I was, I was kind of thinking about when we were going to, to meet and, and do the recording and it just out of the blue, I'm thinking, wow, she's actually kind of doing what she had originally wanted to do. And I wonder if she, if she knows that. And so that was one of the things I, I wanted to point out because I know I've, I've probably got, I haven't looked at yours lately, but I, I, I've got about a quarter of the followers that you do. So even on my level, I get up most days and I, it, it's pretty weighty when you realize the, the responsibility that you have once you have reached a point where you know you've got this number of people waiting for what you are going to tweet or what you are going to say. Mm. Whereas in the beginning, when I, when I first started a social media account, I wasn't thinking about what, you know what I'm saying? I just, you get on there and it's just kind of post something or a thought. But now, while I don't, I, I don't think it's fair to say I think a lot about what I write. I think a lot about the people who are going to be reading what I write. Is that similar to how you think about it or how do you approach it? Yeah. I mean, again, when you, like you said, when I first started tweeting, I think my first tweet was, is hello, is this thing on? I had no idea. <laughs> or my like third tweet was, I really just got on to troll Donald Trump and feel less insane because everybody in my, my Facebook my reality was a Trumper. I think I asked Trump like right. if he if it, I felt bad for him having to see himself naked or something like that. I really just got on to just be a sophomore. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I would find my people there or my voice there. Um, 
But in the beginning, and for a really long time, it was just me sort of venting and getting it off my chest and out there. And it didn't have a target. It didn't have a, a landing spot. It didn't have an airstrip. I didn't, it was just me, just, just stream of consciousness. Hopefully people will find this funny or maybe they'll think it resonates. And I was terrified of my own tweets. I was terrified to just put my own, my own thought, but I was really good at replies. I re reply guy till I die, but I was scared to, for a while to put my own thoughts out there in the universe. Like, Oh God, I have ownership of that now. And then and that was part of the process of me finding my voice through Twitter, which is a whole weird thing to say, but it is true, um, largely. Um, and so that has morphed very over the course of the last couple of years, I would say, where I no longer wanted to just put my thoughts out there and just vent. I wanted them to have a landing spot. I wanted them to have an intention behind them. I wanted them to have an action or, and they don't always. Look, fuck Bill Barr is not an action, although it is in its own way. But like, it's not an intended target, although it is in its own way. But like, I started thinking there has to be more I can be doing that does puts meat behind these bones. And that meant like actually getting involved. It meant, you know, and in getting myself involved in a nonprofit organization that was part of this incredible growing community uh, of suburban women called Red Wine and Blue. It, it meant, it meant making change, real change in school board races that I never, ever thought about before, but behind those words. And those words are not always representative of those things, those aspects of my life. Sometimes it is just, uh, you know, sleepy Don and making fun of him being, you know, yellow and not orange. But the other thing that changed for me that has become increasingly important to me, especially as we watch sort of uh, the wild, wild west that is TikTok and now X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, where it's rife with so much intentional misinformation and dangerous disinformation. I personally take it incredibly, incredibly seriously that what I am saying, what I am telling people is correct, that it is accurate, that it has been vetted, that it has been checked, that I'm not blowing smoke up their ass and I'm not pulling facts out of thin air. It's very important to me because if whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and god knows we can argue that all day long people trust certain people on social media platforms to give them the truth so you better be giving them the truth when they do because if you don't you're doing a disservice and you could be doing an incredible harm to society and i never want to be that person so i take that part of what i do incredibly seriously i i, I so agree and that's why i have been so quick and always will be when somebody points out to me that I've posted something that was factually inaccurate or was, was not, it wasn't on point, mm -hmm. right? I, I will immediately delete it and say, you know what? I, I apologize because that's something else we live in an age of Donald Trump has given people permission to never have to fucking say, I'm sorry. And so people are, are taking that cue and just digging in, refusing to delete a post or to say that they made a mistake. And it's, it's interesting how many of the behavioral things of a good person I now take in the absence of a good role model, you can just look to MAGA and don't do what they do. Right. You know, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, a role model is good, but if you don't have one, just look at these people and don't do that <laughs> shit and, and you'll probably be okay. Right. Just do the opposite. The bar is not that high. Like, just, right. please, they, like, just don't talk about immigrants and, like they're vermin. Please just don't, don't take advantage of someone's death to push, you know, a, a, a talking point of propaganda. Please don't intentionally lie. You know, don't don't incite violence. I mean, these are basic things. Don't, don't spread hate. Like I call her Tammy. Tommy Lauren is constantly going off about how immigrants are here to kill us and to poison the blood of our society. And it's, and her grandfather was an immigrant. And it's like, don't be that. <laughs> don't be that. Right. Absolutely. One thing I, on another podcast where I, I listened to you, I immediately identified one thing you and I had in common and were doing at the same time in 1987, and that is watching the Iran-Contra hearing. Mm. I, I had just gotten a new job, and it was going to be about a week and a half before I actually started. So I had like 
all this time to do nothing. And it just coincided with when that was on, which to point out, as you pointed out, also coincided with the Rangers ticker tape parade. Uh, but I watched in awe of Brennan Sullivan, uh, Oliver North's attorney, and I was spellbound by that. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we were both fascinated by it. But you, as I recall hearing you say, from that point on, you kind of went the liberal route because you would debate with your father, who was a Republican. Yeah. And I, and I, I just kind of figured out this week and thinking about it, kind of why other than living where I live, and that's kind of how everybody else voted, but I kind of took the Republican path via my respect with watching this Marine colonel stand there so stoically, taking the heat for someone else. And my family uh, had lots and lots and lots of military members, uncles, grandfathers, grandparents. And that was something I, I grew up taking very seriously. And so I'm watching this and that's what kind of sucked me into it. And then of course, President Reagan played very brilliantly off of that. So I kind of, my mind melted all of that together, right? In one, one big thing where you couldn't really separate the two. Um, obviously at some point, many years later, I, I left that Republican path because it was no longer a Republican path. It, it was nothing of the sort, but tell me a little bit about what, what was the pivotal moment for you when you kind of took the, the opposite fork in the road of your father. Yeah, it's, it's funny because part of the reason I think that I did it <laughs> is because it, I'm fundamentally like a hothead. And I just, uh, I just, I want to be, I want to be contrary. <laughs> you know, I want to be, like, if you tell me I have right. to, I, do know what I want to be, why? Uh, but, but a fundamentally really, I, I, it's more than that. I, I shouldn't diminish it by saying that because the reason that I watched or listened to, because sometimes it was in the car, which sounds like a recipe for car sickness and often was, but I listened to those hearings and watched those hearings with my dad was because I was the youngest of five and my brother was the only boy and my oldest sister was the scholar and the other sister was the one who, I mean, I love my sister, but she always needed the most attention. And then the other one was more fragile. And so I was the fifth and I was like, well, I don't have a thing. What's my thing? I don't have a thing. I need a thing. I feel like there should be a thing. And nobody was listening to this stuff. My dad seemed extremely interested in it. And I was like, okay, what's this thing? And the next thing I knew, I'm like, this is a thing. We have a thing. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And it all, I, I fell in line with what you thought too. I, I, my family was military and I, my dad worked for the Department of Defense and I was like uniforms and Reagan captured my imagination when I was a very small child. He's an incredibly gifted at order. And, you know, I, I fell in love with all of that. And, um, and I didn't know why, of course. And then my dad and I would eventually get in the car, drive wherever, and we would just start talking about issues and politics. And I would ask a zillion questions before I was just a sponge for it at that point. I was like, I just want to know more. And little by little, those conversations started to evolve into conversations about social issues, about justice, about um, equality, about uh you know, inclusion, we didn't have those words, but basically to say that my dad, a wonderful person, Lebanese immigrant, wasn't the most progressive minded man when it came to things that I didn't even know yet I had a position on, which was how you right. treat someone who's different from you, how you treat minorities, um, what they deserve and don't deserve. And uh, those fundamentals, I, I, I can always remember it, those fundamental like, er, wait, dad, what? Uh, and then I was identifying in real time, like, oh no, that's wrong. And then I like fundamentally believe these things were wrong because they're still fundamental truths to me. And that sort of clicked on a new part of my brain, which was, I want to know all about this political stuff. And I want to have these conversations with my dad that typically did go very well in terms of arguing and then resolving, or at least pe being peaceful afterwards. But I also believed that fundamentally his positions on so many things that were indicative of the party at large were wrong. 
And I knew that that didn't speak to me and that I didn't want to be that. So that was when I was like, oh, I, oh, I didn't know what these things were, but I'm not that. Just like you said about MAGA. And so I, that's when I started to go down that pathway towards like, oh, I'm a Democrat. I now understand that a little bit better, but it just, right. it was a, it was a, a pure curiosity about me and then me being stubborn and being contrarian. And then it was identifying what was actually at the core of who I am as a person. And uh, I think we all have that inside of us. And I think it's, I think it's greater or bigger than any conditioning or, you know, environmental influence could ever be. Right. I, you know, you and I have, several things in common that that I've identified. And one of them is, I think I was probably 40 years old before I realized this, but that so many of the choices in my life, especially early on, were made not necessarily because I was choosing this thing. It's because I, somebody else was choosing that thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll be damned if I'm going to choose that too, <laughs> right. right? And so I wind up over here, not by virtue of, I think that's the good place to be, but because I'm not going to be there. You, you probably understand that pattern, I'm guessing. Totally. I mean, it, and it can, it can lead to good and bad. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I explain it as the classic out of the frying pan and into the fire, Yeah. you know, uh, when you're not choosing where you're going. So as I've gotten older, I, I like to think I have anyway, I've gotten better about going places by choice because I've assessed them ahead of time, other than that's just where I wound up as a result of rebellion. Um, I want to ask you a minute. You've got a character that you do called Becky Sue, and I'll let you tell a bit more about it, but Becky Sue is loosely based on a, a Southern accent. And it's kind of looking at the world through, I, I, I guess, MAGA or a, a Trump supporter's eyes. And after you tell a little bit about kind of how this came to be, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to do something because I've got this character that's loosely based on the World War II vets that I grew up around in my community. I grew up in a rural community, about 6,000 people. A uh, couple of hours from like any place significant in terms of population. So very rural. And after you uh, describe Becky Sue, maybe we can have a short dialogue where I, I do Kenneth based on the people I grew up with as though Kenneth has come out of the grave and he's in 2024 and looking at what's happening now i will just have a brief exchange uh, okay yeah um that's fascinating actually because i would like to, i would like to talk to kenneth i don't know that becky sue would like to talk to kenneth but but i would so i'll do that through <laughs> becky sue um becky sue probably doesn't know what world war ii was she probably thinks we... <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right she might think that that's the one after the civil war she wouldn't know but she wouldn't even know much about that one uh, but it was you mean there was a world war one yeah but the civil war was, yeah. was real nice because they weren't mean to each other which is why they call it civil um but <laughs> becky becky sue came from um a lot of like, i would say like a definitely an intersection of, of different influences in my life because it was um, when other people like Blair Erskine were out there making videos and Blair is legit from Georgia and she's a gift to the universe if you don't know her, but, but I might be frozen. Am I frozen? Was you? Nope. You, nope. Okay. Sorry about that. So Blair is amazing. No, she okay. was making videos on, they were going viral. She now works for the Jimmy Kimmel show. She's a writer. She's her arc is amazing. She's a genius, but she was making videos. Um, they were hysterical and the good liars were putting out videos where they were going to the rallies and just just letting these people talk and like expose their special kind of crazy stupid um and i was like well i can do a southern accent because i do believe i was born in the south in some other life i lived in the south and it's very weird and like i'm old so i'm gonna age myself with this reference but there, but there was a mini series on abc with patrick swayze and it was like north versus south or something i forget if that was what it was called but it was all anybody was watching and it was the lady from general hospital and the guy who ended up being on star trek and i don't know anyone's names but i was like "Ooh, i like the south and i'm about this kid up in new jersey but what so whatever but i was like i've always been able to do a southern accent 
So uh, for whatever reason, and for better or for worse, a lot of people would say, you can't, but that's fine. So I was like, I <laughs> want to do my own character. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And I don't know what she's going to be called. And um, I actually, I thought recently that the Good Liars video was my first, but it wasn't. And then my first was that she takes ivermectin because I was like, these people are special, stupid. Like, this is stupid, <laughs> stupid. They're t and she was like, she didn't know how much ivermectin to take. So she took a whole cup and the whole video, I'm like doubled over in pain because she's like, and I didn't know how much to take. And so I took a whole cup, and, um, which is like, sounds like a lot. Uh so that was the first one and I was making them in my bathroom. And then I saw one of the good liars where they interviewed a lady at a rally and she does the gematria thing, which we don't know what that is. It's like MAGA math where they, each letter is associated with a number and it's like a more. No, that's me. I, yeah, no, it's not familiar. It's called gematria. I, I highly recommend you look it up because it, I, will. I mean, it's just more cult stuff. Like it's like the H is a, the, this number. Maybe it's literally the way they are on the alphabet, I have no idea. It didn't go that far down the rabbit hole. But so she does, this woman does, she's got the sign and everything. She adds up COVID-19 and Barack Obama and she 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 gets, open your eyes. And that's, that's what she gets. And so she explains it, that uh, that the numbers add up to this and the numbers add up to that. And then that Ovid means eyes and the whole thing. And it comes up and she's like, open your eyes. And something means sheep, maybe Ovid means sheep. And she's like, open your eyes people. And the math never math. Like the numbers didn't actually add up, but, and that's real. That's a real thing that exists. And I was like, okay, this is beyond parody, but I'm going to try and parody it, parody it. And I did. And no one knew it was parody. <laughs> well, that's when you know, you're doing a really good job. But like at first, I'm like, no, no, it's a joke, <laughs> it's a joke. She's fake. She's not real. <laughs> and 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 then it sort of became the same where people were like, oh, she's putting down Southerners. And I was like, no, I please, if I could do, I mean, I can sort of do like you know North Dakota, but I don't think like a Megan Ray would have been as funny, you know. Way. So I was like, um, I'm gonna do the one I can do, like you said earlier. I'm gonna do it. And I'm just going to own it. And uh, that's that's why she's Southern. I don't think Southern people are stupid at all. I think Southern people are from the, some of the most fucking funny, amazing, smart, sassy, incredible, no bullshit people I've ever met. And I think I was Southern, by the way. <laughs> right. Oh, I, I agree. You know, I because of whatever this accent that I have that people can never figure out, I was going to be doing, uh, I, th I think they've now torn it down, but I was I was going to be doing a presentation for a group at the Hotel Pennsylvania, right across from Madison Square Garden in New York. This would have been 2007, 2008. And I'd, I'd never done anything in, in New York. And I know I'm right, I'm right downtown and I'm going, damn, maybe I ought to see if I can kind of round off this accent because I don't want them to think, oh, here's this country bumpkin, you know, trying to teach us something. And about a week before I left, I was reading a story about Gene Autry, you know, the, the, the cowboy from the uh, 40s and 50s mm -hmm. television show and, a, and was a, a singer. Yeah. And Gene Autry tried to eliminate, I, I think maybe he was from Texas originally. He tried to eliminate his accent to, to break into show business and, and he went nowhere. And when he finally gave up on that and just started talking how he talked, that's when he became a success. And I thought, you know what, I, I'm just going to go do my thing. And it, what actually happened, they were so fascinated because they don't hear a lot of people straight out of rural Midwest in New York City. So that was the thing that held their attention, which made the teaching part much easier to do. But there is, I would agree with you, there is this perceived lowering of IQ. You can take somebody who has an IQ of 165, but give them a thick, heavy Southern accent, and people from the northernmost areas of the country, they're going to perceive them as, as less intelligent. So uh, I've, I've experienced that myself and it is unfortunate, but like you said, I've met some brilliant people uh, from the South. So we're not making fun of people from the South. My, my character is again, based on the people I grew up around who probably talked closer 
to the way I talk than I would like to admit, uh, but I'm going to kind of exaggerate it to make it uh, sound as, as though they sounded. So here we are. It's however Kenny came back to life. He's crawled up out of the grave. And this is a, a World War II veteran, a Republican, who's had a couple of days to read the newspapers and see what's going on in the world now. And Kenny is going to kind of give his assessment. And then uh, Becky Sue can kind of jump in and, and have an exchange with him. Okay. Well, I'll tell I'm going to tell you one fucking thing. When I was a kid, we didn't have all this bullshit of men laying around with men and females getting underneath the covers with another female and doing God what knows is going on under there. But, and this bullshit, have you seen this stuff of men, men putting on a fucking wig, lipstick and a dress and high heels and claiming to be a goddamn female? Now, they say all that shit is about identity. That's, that's, that's how they identify shit. I'm going to tell you what that is. That's straight up fucking crazy shit. That's not how banging your head off the rubber wall stuff. You know what I mean? Oh, well, I, I don't know about you, but I read Trump's Bible, and that's the best Bible there is. There's no better Bible, and it's new. It's You might not have seen it since you've been done in the ground all those years, um, eating, being eaten by worms. In his Bible, he lays out all the Ten Commandments and um, Amendments, too. And he said um, that there's only two genders. Um, I don't remember. Uh, boys and girls is the genders. And so it ain't right uh, for uh, boys to lay with boys and girls to lay with girls. But as far as them people dressing up and getting all fancy uh, and calling them drag queens, I thought those were strippers. I don't know. That's what I know them to be is strippers. Uh, my, my cousin Chet, he needed one and he's a baby daddy. And uh, yeah, she make a good living. But that I don't know why that call drag. It's not really a drag. It's kind of fun, actually. Well, I've heard about that. And they tell me, of course, I've only been up here for about three days now, but they tell me that they, they go and they have these things called drag races or something of that sort. And that's where they parade around and they fancy themselves up like a woman. And I'm thinking to myself, why in the hell when you was born a man? You, 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 I mean, you know what a man's supposed to do. Why would you want to pretend like you're a woman? I, I, I don't get it, but I will tell you what I've read on this, this President Trump fella. He, he sounds like the kind of man that ain't going to put up with a lot of bullshit. He's not going to, those drag races is going to be over. That shit ain't going to be happening anymore. He get, get that man back in office and we're going to dry up all this LBZTR or whatever in the hell they call it. That, that's going away. That's going away. We're going to stop. Look, all these Mexicans coming over the border, taking our jobs. That shit will be done. You know what they'll do? They'll put their ass on a bus, ship them back to fuck to wherever they come from. And the ones that want to still try to come across, he'll shoot their ass. That'll be all they'll do that. He'll shoot their ass. Well, my favorite president and yours, Donald J. Trump, he loves America so much that he raw dogged a porn star for you and me. And he also stole our NASA security secrets and put him in his chandelier shitter because that's how much he loves America. And he wears a little bit of makeup, okay? He does. Maybe a lot of makeup. But that's what makes him a man because it makes him look tan. And even though he ain't actually tan, he's a man. And I know that rhymes because I went, I finished the eighth grade. I'm the highest grade earner in my family. And them rhymes so i also just want to say he's a real patriot because he's sitting there right now he can't use his cell phone up there in new york city he's got to be awake in court right now while the porn star he raw dog for you and me um talks about his toadstool uh peen and i just i think personally that that's why i'm so glad i have that trump bible because he just tells it like it is <laughs> he's a patriot he's a family man who has sex with porn stars <laughs> beautiful beautiful now while that does not represent every person in the area that i live in or even most of them i've got to tell you i do still know people today who would have that conversation 
that Kenneth just had with Becky Sue. Yeah. I, it, it's, I, I, I really wanted to do that skit, that exchange that we just did for this reason. While it's in jest, I want people to understand that that kind of thinking still very much exists in the deep MAGA cult pockets. It does. And when you examine the lack of depth in terms of how far they peer into an issue and just how surface like the conversation is and it's built upon bits and pieces of things they've heard on the news or on social media or their friends tell told them and they construct this thing and then they talk about it as though it represents the truth and then vote based upon that yeah well the secret and that's frightening the secret sauce for maga for trump is that it reinforces, reinforced originally and reinforces perpetually through disinformation and through flat out lying, the biases that already existed and confirms them for these people so that, and I don't mean these people like as an insult, you know, I, and it's not just the deep pockets of MAGA because I, so I'm surrounded by peers in New Jersey in a, in a red district. Um, thank you very much for flipping that district. Uh, Tom Kane, um, but it's also just very red here who do the, to do the same thing without identifying themselves as maybe. And in Texas, I know Texas, they don't usually identify themselves as MAGA. They're just Republicans or conservatives. Right. Right. But but the but the, what's baked into the cake here is is this is this the power that reinforcing that bias has when you tell somebody that it's OK to think these hateful baseless hateful thoughts about others because inherently like again this speaks to people just just inherently being afraid of others because they feel threatened by them but when you play upon that as we've seen throughout history and as we've seen since donald trump came down that escalator that's a power that you can't nobody else can approximate like you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube and i'm going to mix every metaphor there is just so you know because i've already done three but it's true <laughs> and so what mess they're seeking the messages that reinforce that already bias, but they're not just seeking them. They're being targeted with them. And it's very, very intentional. Um, and it's all about fear, power, and control. Because if you're not offering them anything else, and they're not, and they're not maybe even paying attention to what else they should care about, because they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the time, they're too busy, they're too tired, whatever the fuck it is, they don't want them paying attention anyway. So they're not paying attention to the real stuff. So this stuff, it's being fed to them all the time about kids doing their peepees and kitty litter boxes and CRT and DEI and drag queens coming for your kids' libraries, all this bullshit is being fed to them. They're sharing it out because it just keeps reconfirming their already existing bias and then they don't have to feel shame. And that is all of it. Like that's, that's all it is. And you can do anything. You can get someone to believe anything as long as you've gotten them to a place where everything they've already learned from you makes them feel better about the stuff that somebody else used to tell them they couldn't say or couldn't think. That woke stuff, like don't say the N word. Like that's the kind of stuff that there is so powerful. And so I, and I, and I, and I get it. I know, again, I know people here as an educator, when we had new um, standards coming in related to you know, conversations about uh, diversity, somebody was like, uh, an educator was like, oh, great. So kids can what? Identify as rocks now? They can just be like, oh, hi, I'm a rock. And I'm like, wow no right. um or yes like if sure but no that's not what we're talking about but that's the that's the level of interaction they want to have with reality because the reality doesn't suit all that other stuff that confirms their already pre-existing bias i think you nailed it i just last night i posted something very similar i said you know i often hear people asking the question or making the statement how, how in the world can Trump supporters actually believe all of this BS that he's putting out. How, how can they believe that? And then I said, look, for, forget about whether they actually believe it or not. That's really irrelevant. And in, in fact, I would argue that a lot of them do not believe the, the election lie. They don't 
uh, believe all of his nonsense, but they'll never admit they don't believe it because, as you said, it gives them permission to be the worst form of themselves, the, the form of themselves that they've always secretly wanted to be able to be. But the rules were different before Trump came along. Yeah. And even if you were already kind of a stanky, kind of behaviorally screwy person, you had your limits because society had this framework built around you that said, ah, you, you can push it up to here, but you don't go past that. And Trump came in and took all of that fencing down and said, no, 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 no. You push it as far as you want to. It's okay. And so it's convenient, at the very least, to pretend that you do believe his lies. Right. And I think that that convenient word that you just used sort of nailed it, right? Because ultimately, it's easier. It's easier for anybody to give into the darker impulses in our brains and minds and hearts. It's easier to be angry. It's easier to hate. I, I know that sounds crazy. It's not inherent. Kids don't just come out hating. But as adults, it's easier because it's convenient because it's because it's less work, because it requires less of you using your brain to connect with larger issues, larger than yes. it, whatever it is. But also, it's easy and convenient because it gives you lots of built-in excuses for why whatever is wrong with your life isn't your fault. Whether that's that you didn't get the raise you wanted at, the, at work, whether that's because you didn't excel in school, whether that's because the high school hottie wouldn't bang you, whatever it is. It's it's not really your fault. And built into this, all of this is this excuse system where it's like oh it's their fault it's that person's fault it's a drag queen in a state i've never even been to a thousand miles away that is to blame for my child identifying as non-binary like this is what they do and it and it's laziness sadly because america look americans are in her, a lot of americans are pretty lazy but like we don't want to challenge ourselves. We don't want to challenge our fundamental beliefs and ideals. We don't want to do the work like we talked about at the top of this, where we have to really be introspective and own who we are, good and bad, all of it. Um, so right. th th again, it's self-perpetuating in that way. And it's so powerful. And what it does at the same time, which is also so intentional, is it keeps them at this stasis where they never seek more. They aren't seeking more information. They don't care about banned books. They're not seeking more knowledge. They don't care about news, newspapers disappearing. They're not seeking more information about the rest of the world, which is again, suppression. They're not seeking a higher education and they stay where they are. And then that leaves their options limited for anything else. And so that leaves them relying on those people who keep telling them, this isn't your fault. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. And they don't need to know what that means. And while they're saying that, they're taking away your social security, your Medicaid, your Medicaid, care they're raising your taxes and slashing the taxes for the already super rich guy who owns the meat packing plants and all over your state and they don't know and they don't care because they're never reaching higher and so it's just again the whole thing just it's like a hamster wheel and to break that cycle we really need people who are out there telling the inconvenient truths all the time just driving it home all the time you you really nailed it down there with this one particular concept. I saw a weight loss commercial one time. The opening line was the spokesperson saying this. They came out and said, are you overweight? Well, it's not your fault. Now, that's what every overweight person listening has been wanting and hoping to hear from someone. And the commercial knew that and comes out and gives them exactly what they've and then the brain says maybe there's a solution and and so that's the same thing that trump and the whole MAGA movement has done it's taken that responsibility from people they've they've opened their speeches in one way or another although maybe covertly and indirectly with are you tired of all the bullshit in this country it's not your fault, which opens up then by that very much implicates then implies someone else as being the problem and puts you as the solution. Now, just tell me what I have to do to solve this problem. Hmm. And there's something else. And you mentioned earlier that that after your uh, divorce, I think it was that you experienced a period of depression. I've experienced depression in 
my life, and so I think something we can both identify with, when you are in that funk, that low energy funk, like, fuck it, I don't care, that a flash of anger is very energizing. Mm -hmm. Something pisses you off, and all of a sudden, that person that couldn't move is standing erect. You've got fire coming out of your ears. And in terms of productivity, maybe not on the right stuff, but your productivity and energy level goes sky high because anger breaks you out of that funk. And that's another thing the MAGA movement has done. It's energized people by giving them things to be angry about. Yeah. And yet it provides no direction other than the channeling of anger. No solutions, no policies, no directions. It's all about here's why you should be mad. Oh, now that you're mad, we want you to channel that anger into these people. I mean, you don't even have to imagine that. You're, you're right on, on the money here because they tell us all the time that that's the case. Because <clears throat> what they do all the time is talk about the border, the border, the invasion at the border, Lake and Riley, murder, the invasion at the border. And then the border bill comes up, the border bill they've been asking for, the border bill they've wanted. And they're, and they're like, no. No, 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 what are you doing? We don't want that. We want the border bill. We don't want you to do anything about the border. Come on, dude, you're ruining the whole thing. The vibe is like, we're mad about the border. You can't fix the border. Then we can't be mad about the border. Same thing happened with abortion. Same thing happened with IVF, where they're like, abortion has to be against the law. And we need a ban, we need a ban. And you give them a ban, they're like, God damn it, we didn't want to talk about the ban. Wait, and then IVF, like, oh my God, what are you doing? God, we're not supposed to tell them we're doing the IVF thing. So like, it's like they create, they need they need the chaos. They need the, the 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 crazy. They need the stuff to make people mad about, to fearmonger and scare about, so that they have those flashes of anger, so that they're blinded by them so much that they don't see past their own anger. And conversely, what that also does is largely, not always, and hopefully we can help battle that, but it demoralizes the other side because it's the, 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 the flood the zone with shit Steve Bannon theory that is so deflating and constant and perpetual and overwhelming. And people tell me all the time, I can't do it. I can't do it. There's too much every day. There's something new. And then there's something new on top of there's something new. And then we forgot about the old thing that was new. And it's like, I, I can't keep up. I'm overwhelmed. I need to pull away. And that's the objective. So like, the, so it's two pronged. It's more than two pronged. I do say this a lot, but I think about this thing as like a sea monster, like a kraken, but like a kraken right. octopus with more than eight tentacles. So it's like a, a bazillion of posts. I don't know. I'm making shit up. But the point is it's, it's part of this. It's all part of the same beast, right? So that's, and I I'm, found like I'm giving them too much credit, but I'm not. These fuckers have been working on this shit for generations right and this isn't by yes. accident this is it's like aliens in the um and i am a mixed metaphor fan as i've already said but aliens in the war of the worlds movie with tom hanks the tom cruise not the other time they put the things in the ground and then the things come up and they're born and they were already in the ground so like it was not such a big deal for them to sprout out of the ground this is kind of where we are it's not by mistake it's not by accident it's not overnight it's been a long slow build and it's not done yet but we have to be cognizant of it too like and that's where humanity is the antidote to all of it right that's that is what they don't want us to have because once we have that and we hold on to it and we can see the threads that connect us rather than divide us then we can work together to actually continue to move forward that's why they so desperately need to destroy that because humanity is the cure-all to everything they're trying to push i agree com completely I, I want people to know about your newsletter. Are you effing kidding me? It, it, it's a newsletter I highly recommend. I think everybody should subscribe to your newsletter. Again, it's are you effing kidding me? I, I think one of the things that I like about it is it's, it's long form Joe from Twitter. Right. It because even though we can and, and I think that's one of the things I'm known for, I write some long ass tweets, you know, in the expanded form. I pay my little 11 bucks to Elon a month just so I can do that. But I realized early on I was not necessarily the king of sound bites. I needed I needed a little space to kind of spread my wings. Um, 
but one thing I like about Substack that I'm sure you do as well, it's a place to spread your wings without the fear of what mood Elon is going to wake up in that day and then jerk the rug out from under your feet or implement a new rule. You can't do this. You can't write that. You can't have it that long. It, it, it's a place of security. So tell the listeners a little bit about are you effing kidding me? Your newsletter. Thanks. And thank you for those kind words. It's um, that means a lot to me. It's a very special experience. Uh, I've had with Substack uh, one I did not expect. I really the word I use often is cathartic because it is and it is, as you said, in many cases, in most cases, uh, my tweets in long form, which is how I feel about it when I'm going to go on a rant about, you know, MAGA or Trump or or the ca court case no. today, I'm going to write about. <laughs> How uh, manned the rampart, sorry, rammed the man parts, how stupid, endlessly stupid Trump is. Like we lose sight of how stupid he is often. It's like we talk about all the other things about him, but the Gettysburg Address <laughs> thing, I mean, the Gettysburg, I call it, you know, his Gettysburg Address. Oh my God. And, and it's, it's like, it's gone. It's gone from the news cycle. Of course, it got hit, it got made fun of, but it's gone. And it's like, Eesh. okay, let's just pause a minute and talk about, like, let's just focus for a second on this one component of this person. He is so fucking stupid. Can we ask that our yes. president of the United States of America not be a fucking moron? Like, is it, is, right. can we just all settle on that? Um, so I'm going to write about that today. But back to the Substack. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, it's, it's become this amazing experience for me in large measure because the community that's there, I could cry. Oh God, don't cry. Don't cry. They're amazing and supportive and, and kind and wonderful. And uh, they're readers, which is great. Um, and they get the snark. They understand that. But that's not always what I want to do when I go on there. And this is the thing that is so special for me is that they've been so supportive and they've embraced this other part of my reality, which is who I am as a person and my journey and my truth and sharing the ups and downs and the darkness and being depressed on Christmas because my kids left and just bearing it all out there. And, and, and maybe in yes. some cases, what motivates me to do it is when I'm feeling a certain way, or I've been through a certain thing that impacted me in one way or the other, I feel this like compulsion to maybe pass it forward, to not pass on the trauma or the pain or the suffering, to, to, to pay it forward in terms of if one other person out there can feel seen in something I write, you know, about a trauma, about you know, being raped or about losing my dad or my dog or uh, about my mother's abusive relationship with all of her children. Um, I didn't have somebody like that in my life coming up. I didn't have a place that I felt like, oh, that person sees me. I didn't. And I think I lost my way in many ways as a result of it. It's not to blame. It's just what it is. And that's okay. Um, but I put stuff out there that is very, very raw and very, very honest and truthful about my personal life, because I feel like if people are paying attention to what I'm saying for better or for worse, maybe, just maybe I can do something good in another way that isn't just about, you know, my political voice. So I put a lot of stuff on there like that. And it's some of the stuff that I'm the most proud of, but also it helps me to sort out those those emotions for myself. It's like a journal entry that I'm sharing with the world and hopefully it does reach someone who's like, wow, I didn't know that I, I wasn't alone. So that's that's the big thing about the subsect that I is so special to me. And I'm going to cry. And you do that masterfully, I might add. Uh, the, the, the thing that you said about, you, you said the uh, your subscribers or on Twitter followers, isn't it interesting because it's exactly how I think about them. I think of them as extended family. I mean, there's like this cohesiveness and on your newsletter, uh, you referenced it and, and I get some of those as well for, for 25 years, I primarily helped people with emotional traumas, anxiety, fear based disorders. That was kind of my thing, right? And so my newsletter addresses that with the connection being that the outcome of this election is going to be largely dependent upon how good we feel the closer it gets to November. Because when we are in a funk, when we are low energy, when we are like, fuck it, um, as a population, we have a tendency to not do things like vote. And so to the degree that we can mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually have 
everything tightened up going into this election, I believe the voter count will be considerably higher. And when somebody, when you write something and you almost get an immediate response from somebody that says, oh, I so needed to hear this right now. I know you do because it evokes tears from you. I too, I, I, I don't take that lightly. I don't walk away from that blowing it off. And that's where I come back to talking about that sense of responsibility we have that, I mean, I, I never in a million years, never thought I'd ever be sitting at almost a quarter of a million followers on Twitter. I don't know if you ever dreamed of having a million social media followers, probably not that many, but when you are nearing that or when you get there and you go, man, I, I, I've got a, a task here before me that doesn't just influence me and, and maybe my high school buddy anymore. There are real life human beings with children, with families who may vote or not based upon something I say or write. And for that, I'm so very thankful for social media and the ability to play a role, to get up and go, I'm so glad I was born at this moment because I get to do this right now. I get to be a part of this. And, you know, you mentioned going to the White House and you, you talked about meeting. I love how you asked, you You just said, uh, could, could I get a hug you, when you met President Biden? You said, you know, how would it be possible to get a hug? And you said, he did give you a hug. And the thing that stands out about that, from what you said, and from what I've heard other people say, there's a difference between being seen and understanding that somebody is present with you in that moment. And the way I heard you describe it, you had no doubts about whether he was present with you in that moment. Can can you talk a little bit about President Biden and how he is face to face? Yeah, uh, I will say <laughs> I got owned and, and deservedly so for tweeting that it, it was when someone asked what he smelled like that he smelled like a hot hot, hot chocolate <laughs> on a snowstorm night with the kids and the lights are flickering and and you know what I, I I stand by it I was drunk when I said it I meant it when I said it I mean it today because it's like you know evocative of that feeling and that feeling is the feeling you know when I say it if you've been anywhere that's snowy and your kids have had a snowstorm night and they know they're not going to school the next day and it's like really blustery out and your the light, your lights you are bet. flickering and you have video games and hot cocoa and it's there's only one feeling in the whole world like that and I and that it, you know it doesn't have it's like it's like a it's like a umami kind of thing but like Joe mommy oh my god I just coined Joe mommy okay I'm just letting you know y'all right. Joe mommy TM is happening but it's like that's Joe that's and I call him Joe but like no that's that's Joe Biden and that's this thing this intangible thing that doesn't isn't captured in a single word it really can't be in my in my opinion because you don't expect that from anyone anymore really you don't expect that sort no. of like right no because not at all everybody you know no matter how much they love you no matter how they think you're awesome they're thinking my phone they're thinking the the score of the Mets game they're thinking what am I going to make for dinner they're thinking did I leave the dishwasher running they're thinking a million trillion things whatever it is we live in a world now where we're all kind of like running and all the cogs are going at the same time and you just know someone isn't fully dialed in sometimes you'll have a special moment with somebody that you will feel I'm fully dialed in but generally speaking that's a unicorn so you don't expect <laughs> to meet the president of the United States of America, outside of the White House, not like he's walking on the street, like literally, uh, you know, outside the whatever garden that is, I forget, cell phone, on the cell phone. You don't expect to meet him <laughs> while he's just talked to some other person and he's about to talk to some other person and you're thinking, oh, wow, that's he's talking to them for a long time. What the heck? Maybe he knows them. And then it's your turn. You don't expect that person to just dial in and be like, what, tell me about you. Oh, okay. You're from New Jersey. Hot. So immediately use your name, but not like, not even just like in a polished politician -y kind of way. Like I'm listening to you. I care about what it is you want to tell me. 
And I wanted to tell him about how when I was a kid, I saw a Time magazine he was in. He was one of the candidates for president way back then. And I was like, that's my guy. I picked him. And I didn't even know why. I just picked him, which is a terrible thing to tell him. But I did. And I was, I was, I've been a Biden stan since. It's ironic. But I will say that I'm a Biden stan. But he he had this wonderful conversation with me. It did not seem to have an exit plan for it. He wasn't trying to rush it. It wasn't like he was looking at the next person. It wasn't like he was worried. Someone moves him along for him because he wouldn't move along. <laughs> Honestly, I think he would be stuck. He would not stuck. He would be deliberately talking to one person for the whole time. So I, so we have this amazing moment. And then I'm sort of, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, by the nice people who do the thing. And next it's my friend, Joe, 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 and Joe. I'm not kidding. And Joe has something he wants to tell Joe. And Joe, 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 not me, Joe, Joe, that big Joe, the big Joe, the head Joe, he dials into my friend Joe. <laughs> and now it's just that. It's just, tell me about your grandfather. Oh, really? Well, I have something to add to that. And nothing else is, nothing else is off here or over there. He's, that is and I don't mean nothing else, like he's not calling me over there. I mean nothing else. Like he doesn't want to deviate from this moment of, of att your attention and your time and your story. He values that so much. That's what's missing in society. We're so devoid of those simple interactions that are so deeply satisfying and connecting that they can withstand anything. And that's what's not here. And that's the humanity of this person. That, that we should want someone like that in a position where they're modeling behavior for the entire country and signaling our country's behavior to the world. Conversely, like the other guy, I mean, I mean uh, how many different distinctions could we possibly draw? They couldn't be any more different in that way, but no, yeah. they could not. He just, um, the Joe yeah. Mommy is real. In the, absence of, in the absence of anything else, in the absence of any other information about President Joe Biden, someone listening to that story, that personal story of yours, that connection you had with Joe Biden and the connection that he created with you, that alone would serve as a pretty damn good reason to vote yeah. for Joe Biden. Of course, there's lots more in terms of reasons to vote for him, but but after what we've come through, with Trump, that's a pretty damn solid reason. Yeah. Is somebody who can connect with their fellow human beings. Right. Somebody who wants to. You know? Somebody who wants to. It, it, it wants to. It's an, it wasn't a, a chore. It wasn't, oh, shit, here comes somebody else that wants a hug or a picture or to say hi. Yeah. That, that, like, yeah, I want to do this. Let's wrap up with this because I, I know this is something that you see a lot as well. Sometimes I'll get a comment to a post where someone will say something like this. Well, I'm not a big account like yours, but, right, that they, they diminish the value that they bring to the table based on, on number of followers. So I'm interested in hearing, I know what my take on it is, but I want to hear your take on just how incredibly important it is, whether you have five followers, 50, 500, for you to tweet and message as though you have a million, especially during this last six months leading up to the election. I mean, what it comes down to is like, it's very, the analogy can be drawn that it's like our votes, right? So nobody gives a fuck if my vote is out there versus my neighbor's vote, their votes, they count the same, right? They make the same impact right. when added together or not. Um, and it takes all our votes. So it takes them all in, in concert with each other to make change, to do, to accomplish something. And our voices are very much like that. Um, maybe someone else has got a bigger platform and they can reach more people, but it doesn't mean that that person who doesn't have that platform's voice is any less valid, any less important, um, any, any less motivating for somebody else or just themselves to feel seen. Because once you feel seen and empowered and like you've spoken your truth, then you're going to want to engage. You're going to want to talk to somebody else, probably. You're going to feel validated in, in what you have to say and what's on your mind. And it doesn't matter. Like I said, it doesn't matter if, if, if 
you know, 10 people or a million people hear it or see it. It's really about you. It's about you empowering yourself because we all have to do that. That's the thing about this we the people idea. It's bringing everyone together to make this massive number of people make the change that they want to seek. And you can never diminish your power in any of that. And believing your voice is sort of required in terms of empowering your ability to change the world. And I, I just think don't ever, first of all, don't ever count yourself out and don't ever think, you know, you can't reach a million people someday. You probably could if you did spend your time tweeting 5,000 days of the week like I do, which I know that, that that's not math, but also, yeah, never, the, every feeling, every thought, every uh, moment that you question, it's, it's all valid. And the more you lean into understanding that you have power in your voice, the more you're going to find your voice empowered. And so that's, that's the message, I guess I would say. And that's such a great point, because if you put somebody who just opened a, a X or Twitter account today beside Barack Obama, yes, Barack Obama has a bigger megaphone, but they each count as one vote in November. And ultimately, as we look forward to November, it's that one plus one plus one plus one as many times as we can take it out that we're after. I, I've got to tell you, uh, this has been a blast, and so much so that I hope maybe in the future sometime we can do this uh, again. I want to tell everybody, go out. In fact, just do it now. As soon as as soon as you've watched or listened to this, and subscribe to Are You Effing Kid Kidding Me, uh, Joe's newsletter. I subscribe to it. I've got my own, but I I subscribe to and and read hers. I think you should too. Uh, you'll be better for it. Mm -hmm. You'll learn a lot. You'll be entertained. And uh, you'll see why it was uh, destiny for her to go to a great college uh, like uh, Emerson. Uh, and and why, even though she didn't have the, the grades that every other high school student might have had, they recognized but she's got, she's at that level of the students who did have it based on this essay alone. Now that's, I mean, that's pretty cool. And that's why you should subscribe to her newsletter because her writing got her into a prestigious college and her writing will also get into your head and heart and you'll be glad that it's something you sit down and read each week. So. Joe, wow. thank you so very much. Um, I had a great time. Maybe in the future, too, Kenny and Becky Sue can get back together and talk about <laughs> issues of the world. Yeah. So I will see you uh, next time. And in the meantime, uh, keep the keyboard flying. Thank you for those kind words, though, really, truly. Like, it's, this is the my passion project. It's the, it's the love of my life next to my kids. <laughs> it's really, it's my heart and soul. And I really appreciate that you said those kind things about it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, and this was a blast. <laughs> it was, it was. Agreed. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. All right, look, I, I, I hope you got into that episode as much as I did, because it really felt like I was sitting down with somebody that I had known <laughs> forever. Uh, Joe and I resonate. I mean, we're vibrating on many of the same frequencies, and we just kind of get each other. And it was really the first time I'd ever ventured into uh, kind of something kooky or, or humorous and just being goofy on an episode. But I thought it was very important, and in fact, it was very important in that little skit to give you an idea in an entertaining way about some of the attitudes that still very much exist in rural America and that aren't really hidden. They're not, they don't try to to disguise them, it's just that most of America does not cross paths with these pockets 
in rural America and have the kind of uh, conversations and interactions with people that allow them to, to hear and experience this stuff. Now, much of what I was demonstrating in that skit was from when I was a kid in the 70s and some of the people who were around in my community then and kind of the way they talked. But rest assured, I do still encounter some of those people today. And so I really wanted you to know about the people we have out there who are still influencing today's generations with the language they used and the beliefs that they have about things. Because a lot of people think that just doesn't exist any longer. They think that's just the stuff of movies. I can assure you, it's not. Look, if you do nothing else when you leave this podcast episode, go to Substack, pull up Joe Carducci's Jojo from Jurors, her Are You Effing Kidding Me newsletter. Check it out. <laughs> she is a colorful writer, and I'm sure you will be entertained and educated at the same time. And be sure to go to Twitter and follow her at Jojo from Jurors. And then you can find her on Instagram and threads and Facebook and YouTube and every place else that she is. And also be sure to check out my newsletter at jackhopkinsnow.com. That's where I talk about all things psychological, building resilience, building confidence, shoring up your emotional makeup and your mental game so that with everything that's going to be coming at us and everything that's already coming at us this political season, you'll be squared away, you'll be able to meet it head on and not find yourself curled up in fetal position, scared and wondering, you know, are we going to make it? Yes, we're going to make it and we are going to prevail, but to do that, We've got to have this screwed on tight. And that's my forte. I did it for 25 years with people from around the world. Check it out, jackhopkinsnow.com. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Jack Hopkins Show podcast.